thank you all for staying. It's been a long morning, and I hope you're not too exhausted. Um, I, we also agreed that we, I wouldn't make a huge introduction to uh, our guest today because I think many of you were at her talk yesterday, and so you heard full, full all the details of that meeting slider. But it is a great pleasure for me to introduce you here today. Um, just in case you weren't there, she is the professor of Greek at Leiden University in the Netherlands. So we'll be bringing to us today a, a specifically European perspective, but has spent a lot of time uh, in, in the, well, around the world, but particularly in the US. And um, our relationship goes back uh, almost 20 years, we were figuring out. Um, because for, we were introduced to each other in the 90s, uh, and for a variety of reasons, we decided we wanted to figure out a way that we could align our uh, two universities and our classics departments in a kind of ongoing collaboration. So we um, concocted what's still known today as the Penn Leiden uh, Colloquia on Ancient Values, uh, because this really tapped into uh, some mutual interests of ours. We just kind of clicked the moment we met each other, particularly about some of these big issues um, that we both found uh, very vibrant in, in the classical text that we were reading. Um, I wanted to say that the, we've had eight of the seven or eight, I've lost track how many we've had, but since 2000 we do this every other year. And these are on topics like, well, going in order, manliness in antiquity, free speech, in antiquity, heard some about this yesterday. City and countryside, aesthetics, uh, valuing aesthetics, valuing others. You can tell the reason I'm mentioning these is because these all have to do with values. Where I think in each case we started from issues uh, are, are around these topics, uh, issues in our own time. I think and uh, talked about just quite naturally about these issues that were on our mind in the news at the time and then would go start thinking about how it related to the, the authors and texts and culture that we're more familiar with as scholars. So there's this kind of dialogue even in our conversations about this. Um, so this, I thought we could start not necessarily with those topics, but really go back to your early formation of a, as a scholar, Inika, and uh, you know, just to hear whether you were always interested in making these kind of connections, whether it's something that came only from synergy with others, me, being in America, things like that. Yes, thank you very much, and thank you all for staying on. Um, it's actually a good thing that we only met in the 90s, well, because when I was being trained, uh, you can basically divide classical scholars, I think, in those who are more hardcore, they're into grammar, philology, editing texts, for instance, and there are more who are more interested in all the, the, the softer parts of the discipline, so the cultural questions, etc. I was trained as a hardcore, nerdy kind of person. <laughs> so while all kinds of interesting questions were being played out in society, I, I, I basically only called on to those about 20 years later, <laughs> because at the time I was in the library learning Greek grammar and was more ancient, ancient Greek grammarian. So I was interested in what the Greeks themselves said about the Greek language. Well, that is really an acquired taste. It just, <laughs> not that many people read those texts. I did the history of grammar, the history of rhetoric. Well, some of that could be applied to other things. And it was really only when I had stayed in the United States for a year and encountered other scholars who, it turned out, had read completely different books. They were interested in different questions. And in that year, it was a year that I was in, in Washington, DC, people were really talking about a famous legal case, the Colorado Amendment 2 case, where Martha Nussbaum had served as an expert witness and this was about the position of gays, the possibility of protecting them against discrimination. And I thought, she is asked as an expert witness. And so she is applying all this stuff that I'm interested in, in classics, to something that will affect the lives of real people now. And I was so fascinated by that, that that really drew me into a whole, a whole area for which I think I am temperamentally actually suited. And I'm so happy that the order was the one that I followed. I learned the technical stuff here first. I became a specialist. And only then did I branch out. Because I think if you start the other way around, 
you're never going to have that real grounding in the, the text and stuff. And you will not understand when you need to call in a specialist. Because could, I, could I just ask yeah. you about, about that case? And because yeah. it, it's, it's actually a really good example of, of at least how classical, classical authors and issues do kind of rise to, to sort of a kind of popular consciousness. Um, did, did you think when all is said and done, well, let me rephrase that. What was the role that classical intellectual history, essentially is what it was, classical intellectual history played in, in an actual case that is, was it useful? Was it, what did it bring? I guess the question I'm always asking in these cases, does it bring clarity to the present? That's how I would phrase that. And did it bring clarity to, the, to that court case? Did it help us kind of understand the issue for today? for the specific bit of legislation that was being debated at the time? Yes, the short answer to that is no. <laughs> but, but, but obviously there's more to be said than that. Maybe I should yes. explain the case just a little bit. Yeah, that's not probably, everyone that's may that's be probably familiar with it. Yeah. So it was called the Colorado Amendment 2 case because the state of Colorado uh, proposed an amendment to its state constitution to the effect that no cities would be allowed to adopt rules protecting people against discrimination on the basis of their sexual orientation. So in other words, sexual orientation would no longer constitute a grounds for protection against discrimination. It was pretty far reaching. Some cities in Colorado already had rules like that. And so they sued the state of Colorado. The state was the defendant. It went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Well, one argument that was being made was that really the only way, the only grounds on which you could condemn homosexuality morally was if you used religious argumentation, religious arguments. And that would make it unconstitutional because the Constitution of the United States forbids the, the establishment of religion as a basis for, for legislation. And so, um, the people who were defending the state brought in a bunch of moral philosophers to explain that you could have serious moral objections to homosexuality not based on Christianity. So that's why they looked in classical antiquity because at least they can't be suspected of being Christian <laughs> just by True. virtue of being too early. Uh, and so they looked at, at Plato and Aristotle and the bad news was that, for me personally, I'm sorry, I do have point of view here, <laughs> and the stake, quite frankly. Um, the, the thing is, there are remarks in the ancient philosophers that look, really do look like moral condemnation of homosexuality. And for them, it was sufficient to uphold only one such case, because they just needed to prove that you could have those objections while being a serious philosopher and not being a Christian. The other party brought in Martha Nussbaum, and so she was in a very unenviable position because she had to deal with every single instance that could look bad, and had to either say there is no moral condemnation here, or cast sufficient doubt on the interpretation, which fortunately is not that hard most of the time, <laughs> uh, so that you just couldn't use it in court. And actually that is what happened in the end because the, the judge, just threw out that whole line of argument because on a, on a reasonable ground saying, you know, it's not for a judge to decide a controversy between scholars. I mean, we can, you can do that by verdict. That's not how it goes. So in this case, did it bring clarity? No, but what it did do is it, it um, uh, caused a whole series of studies, serious studies on ancient homosexuality and that is something that people are interested in if a, a topic like this becomes important in society because of the discussions. That in itself will spark off research into classical antiquity. And so what I would say about it is that there is a certain demand in, this is not just a ploy that classicists have to uh, keep right. their funding so it, right, <laughs> to seem relevant. But uh, society actually asks, so what is the history of it? What is the basis for this? What is the tradition? And what can we anchor our current views to? They're looking for that. So in that sense. So in, in this case, there's a, there's a sense in which, uh, and there are two issues here. So one is uh, 
that it enriches classical scholarship, or, or even, not even just to keep it so parochial, but um, it's useful, uh, we can go from the present to the past, it's useful to take present issues and see how that may help us think about the past. Does it work in the reverse? Maybe not in this case, but in, in, your, in your thinking about the, I mean, I hate to use these terms, we are here to talk about sort of utility and relevance and all of these, what's, what's the point? In classics, because certainly in this group we probably don't need to ask it. We all have good answers for it. But outside this group, it is being asked quite a bit. Um, and you could you could rephrase, retitle this this session as you know, why classics and why now. And so does it go does it go the other way? Would you say? Uh, well, th this is obviously a discussion that's going on everywhere, and I've had to defend classics many times in the Netherlands too, because people do ask the question. I will say one thing about that defense thing, however, which is that the question is often raised by classicists themselves. And yeah, so Mar Mary Beard just uh, wrote a, a recent book, and she pointed out that classics is, is sort of doing it to themselves, that they, they posture as if classics is constantly threatened and on the verge of disappearing altogether. And this has been the case since antiquity itself. <laughs> people have been worried. There's a whole tradition of people worrying about uh, no one is reading Homer anymore. They don't know their Virgil. I read medieval scholars saying exactly the same thing. And, and she says it's part of our rhetoric. So we also have to be careful about that. But the question is also asked by this, this is true. I, I always uh, think that you can give three types of answers to this. The first is, uh, on the lines of, we are not pigs, uh, and- the, Some of you will get this illusion, but you <laughs> Yeah, this is actually Plato, uh, you know, they're designing a new state. They have a state that sort of seems to work. People have food and houses, and there's nothing much else there. Everyone has a job. And then they say to each other, well, it seems we have design. Uh, a society fit for pigs. Right. Right. Now what? Now what? Yeah. what? What is this good for? <laughs> Why would we want point, to be point. living? <laughs> so we're not pigs. We value these cultural uh, things. There is, like I said, there's just a cultural demand in society itself. People want to study these things. And that is a value in and of, in and of itself. I think that is a reasonable argument to make. It's a completely value-based argument. Ah, sometimes though that's maybe not enough because people say why does classics you can study other kinds of cultures why this one well in Europe and America and Europe have similar discourses about this the, the next line of defense so to speak is to say well classics is an incredibly valuable way to teach people ideals of active citizenship and uh, so civic ideals, ideas about democracy, about the relationship between individuals and the state, about all these things, in fact, that we can name the Greek tragedies uh, that talk about these things. Or, and a second uh, element to that is that if you study these texts as a, as a way into being responsible citizens and thinking about the position of human beings in the world, uh, you're at the same time plugging yourself into a whole tradition of thinking of these same, about these same questions. They're important questions. We've always thought about them. And people through the ages have used classics as uh, to think with. To, so is this a situation where um, the attitude of Socrates would apply, or Antigone, or how does it differ? How is it the same? And if we invoke those same models, we're plugged into that discussion straight away. So we're now also talking to Renaissance scholars and thinkers and to 19th century philosophers. And we look at paintings and we recognize what's going on there. So you just become part of your own tradition in a way. That would be the second line of defense. I, I have a, there's a third, right? Oh, yes, the third. I wanted oh. to give you a chance to say something too, Ralph. Yes, okay, well, I know what the third is, and we're going to get to that in a second, but I did want to ask you a classic question about this, um, because living in our ever-increasingly pluralistic society and world, people may, may 
and, and do uh, counter what you just said, not by repudiating it, but by saying, well, you know, are you giving a certain privilege to the Greco-Roman or the Mediterranean, the modern Mediterranean world? Like, is it, I mean, there are other models one could use, there are other cultures one could, other pre-modern cultures one could study and one could use uh, in similar ways. So, um, I mean, I think we all, especially those who are academics, have their own versions of an answer to this. Um, I know I have mine, but I, I'd be curious to know how you would say, or how would you would answer the question, is there something special about our beloved Greeks and Romans um, that, that other cultures or other histories or other literatures don't do as well, don't do it the same way, don't do as efficaciously, something like that. Right. Well, um, I live in Europe, and we are trying to form some kind of European community. And that means that it's very important to have a shared vision of our past. Now, the one thing, like the common denominator that all European countries can refer to, is the history of the Greeks and Romans. So in that sense, yes, that is pretty unique. It is that culture that we share and that we can all refer to. That's also why it's useful not to just to read the, the text in translation, but to actually have the Latin, because that is what we share. Also, the experience of learning Latin is for certain groups throughout Europe and in the US, a shared experience, so, so that's special. But if you're thinking about the, the human issues that make us love classics, can you get to those through the texts and the concerns of other cultures? I'm sure that you can. And in fact, I think that our world has expanded so much. And it is so much more multicultural. It, it is more cosmopolitan. I think it's actually crucial that there are also people who study those other cultures and bring those perspectives to the table, but that doesn't mean that there should not be also a, a certain group of people in society who have access to these the classical tradition and can just bring that to the table when we're discussing these, these big issues. I'm not saying that everyone must study classics or you will not be a good person. That would be crazy. It would absolutely Wait, really? be scandalous. <laughs> yeah? But it, it's, it's a value in itself that there is a group that did study it and can bring this to the table. So that's how we're going to That's great, thank you. Um, I, but le in the interest of time, let's get on to number three, which is the most, uh, probably the most exciting defense that uh, Inigo is alluding to. And why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your, um, your sort of initiative and uh, currently underway in the Netherlands. Right, thank you. So um, this was actually, a, the way we started thinking about this um, was that I was uh, involved in, uh, actually defending not just classics, but humanities at large, because I was part of a funding organization. And the Dutch government had just started a new uh, research and funding policy, the money and the principles go hand in hand here, where basically that they said the most important thing in, uh, thing in Dutch research and society is innovation. We want to be an innovative society, is really one of those words. <laughs> And to my surprise, actually, and also consternation, it turns out that they had in mind to delegate the whole issue of innovation to the sciences and the medical sciences. Because where else would you find innovation? And when I started looking into that, I saw that there's actually quite a bit of research that shows that you may, do, you may have inventions, but for an actual innovation to come about, People must be willing to accept it, to understand what's going on, to adopt it in their lives. And so you have to take into account the social and humanities side aspects of innovation. And so the classicists, actually, maybe surprisingly, but it's worked quite well, because we, thought we know something about this, maybe, or we realize something that apparently is not so much on the radar for everyone. And it's again about, you know, you have a knowledge-based society. You want to bring the knowledge to the table that is there, not just in the sciences, in the social sciences, in the humanities. What we know about is anchoring. And so we designed this large research agenda called Anchoring Innovation. 
Uh, we just had an example on the screen earlier. What, uh, what was it? Oh yeah, the, the mechanical donkey. Were you here for uh, the mechanical yeah. donkey? Yeah. So why did that thing look like a donkey? It is just a mechanical device for transporting um, materials and stuff. By designing it, just as a design feature, as a donkey, we immediately understand what it is for. It is just something, look at um, electrical cars, for instance. If you take fuel in an electrical car, that is just a matter of putting a plug into the, the outlet. In the initial design of the electrical car, where was the outlet on the car? Where did you have to plug it in? Precisely where the gas tank used to be. And also, <coughs> the plug, this unexpected hefty look of something that you yeah. can stick into something else, it looked just exactly like you were taking fuel on a traditional thing. Well, there's many examples in antiquity and later times where uh, both in material culture and actually in literary culture, in culture culture, in legal culture, everywhere, where people are just, maybe without realizing it, they're innovating, but they're anchoring what they're doing to something that is already known. And actually we have so many uh, elements in humanities that do this but without using this common denominator. So people who are doing intertextuality, Look at how texts to talk to each other, older, newer to older ones. It's a form of anchoring, innovation. Memory studies are uses of the past to understand our current situation. It's a form of anchoring innovation. So actually it's a label or a concept that can bring many forms of humanities studies together and that can show to uh, the government, I mean, I have given a talk about this to our department of economics, the director, if innovation was there, I was completely thrilled that they were willing to listen to it, and they were just intrigued, and they said, so how do we get information about this? I said, give me a call. <laughs> so can you, can you give us a, a specific example, say, in that talk, what that, from that talk, of how you would convince an economist that there's a role that a classicist could play, or at least the discipline of classics could play, in their thinking, in their worlds. Yeah, because the thing here is, again, that you don't give simplistic parallels. You don't say, this is the same as this. You look just one level higher of an abstraction, right? So you look at system features, as it were. So my examples included this electrical car, but I could put that side by side with, uh, do you know, um, you have these Greek temples, and on the top of the architrave, you have these little things called gutai, little droplets, which must have been a hell of a lot of work to carve out in the stone. They, are, they have no function, no structural function. They don't support anything. They're not very important in the, in the pictorial program of the temple. But what they probably are is the representation in stone of what would have been a functional item when the temples were still being built in wood. So people, they were pins used for attaching beams to each other. So people were apparently just used to temples looking like that, and they were able to go to all this trouble to make a stone temple look like the wooden temples that they were used to. Like we put the plug of the electrical car in a place that would people may understand automatically what they're supposed to do. Where do I plug this in? Well, they go for that spot automatically. Now I see that uh, the plug can also go in other positions because we're more used to the electrical car. It's a transitional thing. So it's so a bit sort of knowing, knowing uh, the, a history of a phenomenon, knowing its history is relevant to how innovation might go forward. And this is, is this the argument. Yes, but you, and you can make it not just in uh, material culture, but also, for example, um, there was this, uh, in, in ancient Greece, there was, so there was the war against the Persians, there's this wonderful story in Herodotus about the, the Athenians deliberating about what to do. They know the, per the Persians are coming, they will be taking the city and destroy it probably, what are they supposed to do? There's two parties, one says, let's go up to the Acropolis and defend ourselves there. One says, no, let's build a fleet. We must just give up on the land war. Let's build a fleet. People send someone to Delphi. 
which the Greeks do. W why would you do that anyway? So, right. They get a, a disastrous oracle, refuse to go away. There's the first sit-down strike in history. Get a better one, it worked too, right? They get a better oracle, slightly better, not very much. <laughs> but they're promised that the only hope that the Greeks will have is the protection of a wooden wall. They go back to Athens. Now, what happens there? So what you see is that you get a debate over the interpretation of an oracle. And the two parties who had their policies ready anyway, their preferences, must now try to attach their preference to that oracle, anchor it in the oracle. The one who does the best job wins. So the one party says wooden wall. Well, wasn't there a, a wooden fence around the Acropolis at some, at some point? So the oracle says we must go up to the Acropolis, which is what they wanted anyway. And Themistocles says, no, the wooden wall, that's clearly a reference. It's a metaphor, right? It's the reference to the fleet. We must build the fleet. So, and he wins. And then Herodotus miraculously said, so they started building the fleet, for that was what the god wanted. As if there hadn't been a debate over what the god wanted just minutes previously. Now if we look at the modern example, take Obamacare, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. It was taken all the way to Supreme Court to see if it was constitutional. Why? Why did we do that? The, the Supreme Court functions as a kind of anchoring device. So whichever party, and again, the parties had their opinion ready. Some wanted it, some didn't. And the party that could make the argument that attached this new proposal best to the Constitution of the United States and the founding fathers were not thinking about health care uh, would win the day. So you know how it ended. One party says, um, it is unconstitutional because you can't force people into economic activity and this is just selling an insurance, so it's unconstitutional. And the court comes down on the other side, says, no, the federal government is entitled to levy a tax. And this is a form of taxation. So there is an unbroken line from the Constitution to Obamacare, miraculously enough. And that is sufficient from now onwards until there is new, there is a, a new law case or something. It is anchored in the Constitution. That's how these things work. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask one more question and then maybe we should open for questions. Is that, yeah. we have, okay, yeah. Um, and, and that's about what uh, your anchoring innovation. And, and it's, a, it's a general question. It, it's so what I'm hearing, well, I'll ask it as a question. Is there a specificity to classics or is this more a kind of brief for um, the humanities? Uh, you, know, you know, I mean, I think, yes. it, where is the, I, I mean, I, it, or is it that you're conceptualizing classics as a subset of the humanities and this is what we do? So the argument can be made from within our discipline for something that equally applies to humanistic uh, endeavors to more largely conceive. Right, well, the way I see it is that, that uh, classics is actually a microcosm of the humanities. We have this, this one object of study, a certain uh, geographical area in a certain <coughs> period of time. But if you look at classicists, we uh, represent all these different disciplines. There are linguists, there are literary scholars, people study material culture, they do ancient history, there are philosophers. We bring in theories from the social sciences and apply it to classics. So there are economic historians, social historians, we do the social psychology, we apply in cognitive studies. And so classics is actually an ideal reading ground to, uh, we can solve contemporary project, uh, problems directly and I don't think we should have the ambition to do that because we're just not trained to do that. But we can raise the awareness that we have something to bring to the table because we can show how it works in a period that, you know, it gives us a little distanciation from all those hot problems with the, the urgency and the emotional involvement that you see in societal debate. We can be a little more at a distance and say, look, you can you make this type of analysis in human problems of this nature. Now let's see what happens when we apply it. That's how it works. That's great, thank you. Um, so Grace, should, should we open it up? Uh, the floor is open. 
I'd love to hear some questions along these lines. Bridget. Uh, Nika, I wondered if you could comment on um, the different status of scholarly endeavor around the classics vis-a-vis -vis the artistic endeavors that we were hearing about earlier. Because it seems as if, um, you know, well, I was thinking of like Ben saying, if myth, you know, if myth is infinitely malleable, the details don't matter. Uh, or then we were hearing about the Oedipus myth being given a kind of Christian inflection, and that's great, that's fine in the context of a new play. Um, but for scholars, the details do matter. And there's this getting it right, or getting it as right as you can, which is just a different kind of um, procedure. And I'm wondering if that inhibits um, the utility of classics for the, you know, of the scholarly endeavor. I mean, we saw that it was kind of a dead end in the Colorado case. Um, or whether it just gives scholars a different kind of role. Yes, thank you. I think the Colorado case, that was not thought up by scholars. They just got pulled in, right? And it's just the wrong way to use classics, I would say. You can't just expect them to solve issues like this, just like that. That's just not the right way. I think you need both, actually. The fact that people are still you know, making a movie like Troy is fantastic, because it means there is a live engagement with the material that is dear to us. And I object if a classicist says they, they got it wrong, as if Homer is the only version that got it right, and as if Homer itself is also not a version of a story that must have been around. It's the idea of Troy that, that, that's important. Yeah, it's still there, and people want to refer to it. And they actually, there are all these modern references in that movie that uh, make it speak to a modern audience. But there is a value to the scholars also saying, well, so this is what we know about it, the ancient version of it, and you can study that, and what you can learn from that is that you need to look at these cultural uh, manifestations in context and with respect for their historic specificity and what it meant for the audience at that time, because that is also how you would want people to interpret our own culture eventually we bring other associations to these texts, etc. So there's a value to both. And I'm, I'm always a little worried when um, classicists become too territorial. I'm happy when people want to do something. Gatekeepers. <laughs> yeah, not, yeah, gatekeepers. But at the same time, we do have a special responsibility also for transmitting actual knowledge about antiquity rather than just uh, running with it, uh, as it were. So I'm, I apologize for that. I wasn't able to attend your talk and hear your introduction about how you were introduced yesterday. But it seems to me a lot of the questions you're raising, and it's very specific for Swarthmore, would be I'm curious about your, your, the, the structure of the curriculum in your institution in Leiden. And my understanding is most European universities, you study your subject and you study classics and you're not doing liberal arts and that we, the, the, we do the liberal arts program which is that classics would always, always, even for a, a classic major, is in mix with other things in dialogue with other things in the student's program of study. And I'm wondering how, if there's any serious conversation happening in your environment or if you see a usefulness to the idea of a kind of more interdisciplinary education, if not exactly the American liberal arts model, because it seems to me the, the, the arguments about utility or whatever it is for classics really require, the kinds of arguments you're making do require knowledge across disciplines to make the kind of analogs and metaphors and connections that you're making very clearly. But how is that part of the case for classics in higher education, a person who gets along with wider professors on and on Well, I am a classics professor in life. Uh, in a non-liberal arts system, yeah. and I do talk about these things, as you can, as yeah. you can tell. Yeah. So it's possible to get there, uh, even <laughs> without a liberal yeah. arts education. So that's, that's the, the first thing. Um, there are some possibilities for liberal arts education in Europe now also. We have these university colleges that have taken on board that model. I'm actually quite happy with the model we have too, because it means people get a, a pretty thorough uh, education in a discipline. They really know that field even as undergraduates. And uh, then they can branch out and bring in more things. So the, the, the Arab 
or causality, as it were, is reversed. It may be true that actually, since adolescents are not yet in the best position to make these definitive choices about their lives, that it would have been better if it was the other way around, broader at the beginning and then tapering. Uh, it's, it's working. And one of the things that we, we are saying in uh, Leiden is that we find it important that our students think about the place of classics in society at large and that they are aware of the necessity of uh, collaboration between uh, disciplines. We, of course, have also still have, that's just a fortunate thing, that this whole tradition of gymnasium teaching. So the students who come to classics have followed a particular high school stream with classics. They already have, usually both languages, have had them for several years in high school, in an environment where they're also asked to think about a lot of other things. So I find my students pretty open-minded and they're happy when they're offered seminars. It's also a matter of what teaching you offer, where they're, big, where they're made to think about these issues. Is there a public guide? In the high school curricula in the Netherlands or Europe, um, but you have the Netherlands, the best I guess, uh, is, is there, are, there's, are, there con are there conversations that are at the high school level, which are usually here at the higher education level, about you know, coming from parents and concerned parents about careers and things like that? Um, is that just is it not as, acute, as acute as you hear now? This is, of course, these things start pretty early now, and, the, and the students we're seeing as freshmen sometimes can transcend it, and sometimes are quite acculturated to to find the study of classics as a concept rather alien, if not uh, pernicious. Well, uh, again, we're in the fortunate position that for the last. I don't know, 15 years, I've been able to say to any incoming students with uh, concerns about employability, there are no jobless classicists in the Netherlands because uh, we ha they can always become classics teachers. That is not something that we consider, like they're not failed academics or something, that is an extremely valuable follow-up on their studies. We work together with the high schools a lot. Uh, high schools and universities, that's really it's very uh, fluid and malleable. And so, yeah, parents sometimes do prefer for their kids to study economics or something else that will, or, or law. Um, but we still get students. It sounds like it's not as strong. Yes, the rhetoric is quite strong. Because the, the gymnasium also brings prestige. Uh, parents also like that. I think that's we're going to it's stop. Not. Okay, there's one question. Oh, yes. I don't need to be the last one. We can continue to ask questions and talk over lunch. Over lunch, okay. lunch immediately. Yes. Immediately. Um, okay. And thank everyone one more time, please. Um,